All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. Welcome to episode 468 of the Kiss FAQ podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Today, well, Lonnie's not here. Come back, Lonnie. Come back. Uh, But Marcus Almighty is here. And 69th Blizzard Ken is also present. And we are not live today. So this is Memorex. We're We're going to record this episode to tracks. So this will be the Millie Vanilli of KISS FAQ podcast episodes. But we are going to go to the KISS FAQ message board for most of the topics this week. Um, anyone had any purchases, music-wise, since the last episode that you want to share? Yeah. Um, I finally got, uh, what is it, uh, Eric Carr. Um, Rockology. On vinyl. The, yeah, Rockology from the record store day. So I thought, uh, well, maybe I'll, you know, open it up um, right here. Yay, open it up. Not live, I guess, because it's recorded, right? I was going to say it's live. No, it's well, you're, live. You're, Ken's going to do here it his, is, yeah. his unpacking video. Hard, hard time finding it, but I got it for it its normal price, actually. I didn't pay with the crazy amounts that they're charging now for this thing. So... Let's, let's open it up. Let's Did you use your cred as a KISS FAQ astute member to get it at regular price? I don't get Did it. Did you say that I'm Ken, That's the no voice cred. of reason? How dare you raise the price yeah, like, to me? Yeah, they, like they have no idea. <laughs> I ever mentioned there's a, a po- KISS podcast like in a register. <laughs> there is? And I was like, yeah, I'm on it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so this is like the fake OB... That was on the left side of it. That, look, just just point out the part where it point it tells you the size of an LP. <laughs> yeah, twelve oh. by. It what? actually has the measurements. New solo yeah. album style. Well, th- this size is oh no, twelve inches. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the actual. Uh, right they actually here. put that on an OB. Down here it shows. This is 12 yeah. inches. Well, no wow. kidding. That's and, what normally is, you know, to and fit in a 12-inch lead. It's probably a slightly less than 12 inches. Maybe. Not 11. Uh, then you got the size of the uh, poster that's supposed to be in here, too. So so here it is. That nice. cover does look looks, good. Looks like the, you know, it's the, from the painting that they did. Or the, uh, what's the guy? Carigotti? Uh, what's his name? No I idea. The guy. The guy who painted the solo album. And that is not a uh, that's not a gatefold, right? This is not a gatefold. It's so it's a slip one. And it's and single it's LP or open. double LP. It's a double. Okay. Um, are, so, the, uh, are the are the in, are goes, the inner huh? dust sleeves mark approved? Well, we'll find out. Uh-oh. Let's find out. But that looks a, great. Like a, a poster replication, that's cool. like the uh, other. Well, I was kind of wondering if you could put it next to the other one and make it look like connected to as a puzzle, like if it worked. You know, if they. This is a big moment out. for me. I want to know if they have actual decent inner sleeves on this or not. This is a inner sleeve. It's not. It's the slick kind of paper. Um, oh, I like that. Also, it's not even in like a. So it's like a, one of those kind of uh, inner yeah, sleeves. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's. It's not a. Is it's it a lined? Bad paper. It's not the bad paper. Or is it just like paper? At least. It's, it's just, just paper. paper. It's paper. There's no special uh, coating or nice, 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 color. Nice, nice. But here is the. Uh, I guess one side of the splatter vinyl. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That looks pretty decent. The other side has the. Uh, yeah, like the makeup kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Nice. I like that. So, so that's that one. I think the other one's supposed to be different. Yeah, it's a different color, I think. All right. And same kind of sleeve. Is it uh, also this twelve is more inches? Like a transparent type. This one yeah, is I'll also get, I'll twelve get inches. Out, uh, I'll get out <laughs> something to compare it to make sure it's twelve inches. <clears throat> All right. So 
Here you go. Yeah, That's I like okay. that. They, Semi-transparent they... kind of yeah. deal there. But it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and that's that's all you get in it. Um, nothing What's else. What's the other inner so. sleeve like? It's the same. It's, it's the same thing? Same pictures? And uh, a little different. Uh, oh, okay. Picture. picture. Yeah. So, nice. um, that was yeah. used. That's, uh, I think, Madison Square Garden, the last show. Um, they used that on oh, the yeah. back of the picture disc. That's... Hello? Hello. Nice. Anyway, so... <laughs> Okay, so that is it. So uh, I'll probably play it once, you know, and then <laughs> put it away, uh, sort of thing. So, but finally got it. You can go with the other solo albums, kind of put it with those. There you have it. Well, very oh, good. Because because I'm not bu- I'm not buying it. I, I just don't need it. Uh, it does look good, yeah. but um, I would have rather had the CD simply for digital music. I I really want to get rid of. It the rest of my LPs um, because they just take up space. But that looks good. I I think the design's nice. It's a nice design. Yeah, I've seen people who've lined it up next to the original 78 solo albums, and it goes well. It fits in. Mm. So it's nice that it's finally been done. But that Obi is just, that's hilarious. Mm. Sorry. Closest thing to a uh, Kiss release on Record Store Day. I, I would say this was the closest which is yeah. unfortunate. I, I know. I mean, they have Ace. We've had Ace things, but and we had still, the shattered out loud. 45. Still, Kiss is miss, missing out on it. Oh, but that's not wasn't that wasn't record store. Yet. Oh, that special shouted out. Yeah, no, that was a, a store special. Yeah, mm. and and he was giving those away in San Pedro. I was like, don't give those away. Those are really rare. Don't give those to the fans. <laughs> yeah. No, very 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 cool, Mark. You you get anything this week, Kiss related? Mm, no, I got like a bunch of other Headache. non-related things. Like I got some. I got an Aerosmith gun with mirrors album. I just one Canadian first pressing. Right. What else? I got like a Robin Trower album. A bunch of other stuff. I didn't get much Kiss. I mean, look, I still have like even though I sold a bunch of my Kiss records when I would need it to for monetary reasons, I still have like over two hundred Kiss albums. So it's not like I'm really like you know low on the Kiss vinyl. So and I am buying whenever stuff comes out so but nothing of late let's just no. say Don Romero's good choice underrated album and we'll be t- I think we might actually talk about that a little bit more shortly so today's episode we're going into a few different topics oh yeah did I buy anything no I was actually up in Santa Rosa today and I was like oh I'm gonna go to the record store on my way back and they changed the hours <laughs> Or I misremember the hours, and I wasn't going to sit around waiting an hour for it to open, so I did not get to go, I feel. Oh, and I was like, uh-huh. well, Aeros- Aerosmith tickets go on sale tomorrow, so I really shouldn't be buying any vinyl anyway. So, um, mm. All right, so getting, getting back to um, the topics for today, I think news-wise, there's not a lot to cover. On Spotify, and you can find this on the FAQ, Jane Book, who was in Balls of Fire with Peter Chris has released an album on Spotify, which includes a lot of demos um, recorded in the 1980s. I don't believe any of those feature Peter. Um, I don't think he was in the band long enough for that to happen. But it does feature songs that were performed by Balls of Fire with him behind the kit. Um, So you can find that on Spotify under her name. That is B-O-O-K-E and Jane, of course. And uh, then if you, Kiss Related Recordings did a, a good analysis, I think, of, ball, of Balls of Fire, and I know Talvis did as well, um, for the, the very few number of shows that they did perform, and that the people just yelling at Peter to play Kiss stuff, when instead it was like mid-80s synth rock, you know, a very, very decaf, watered down um, so kind of interesting from that point. What else? Um, South American tour concluded. The guys are back in the states now. They'll have one show this month. Now, what are your? Now that those shows in South America are done, it's clear, at least from that run, that they didn't change the setup at all, other than the shortened one the first night uh, because of Gene's chair issues, or perhaps because of the format, either or. Uh, but making love is it. It's. Um, a new addition to the set. It looks like it's going to stick. Paul and Tommy doing guitar duets on Calling Dr. Love. Um, 
But it's pretty much the same show. Any thoughts on that? We're in the final run, first, what, eight shows are in the, well, in the trash can of history now. Um, how do you feel about that, Ken? Any any feels? I mean, the only thing is was cool is, you know, the big crowds down there and, and the, how they you know, <laughs> sing along to the riffs of a lot of the songs and that sort of stuff, um, which is always very cool. Um, as for the show itself, yeah, it's your sta- standard Kiss show. Um, I noticed the was it was there was there only three pods uh, on it? Is that yeah? That's why I thought I saw. It. So we're down to three pods now. Just, we've gone from I don't know, trimming orig- down originally from twelve what, or twelve however or many. 18, eighteen at the. I it was always oh, eighteen. Yeah. Yeah. I think we saw them in Sacramento. Uh, they break and they don't 18. replace them. Yeah, yeah. So eh, they're they kind of just going away, <laughs> one at a time. I th- um, I think that reduction though is more because of the travel and the sort of staging that is available. Da- yeah, you know there the are monsters. limitations as to whether it is safe and whether they feel it is safe to you know use a full on American production in a country that may be um, language barrier technical yeah. limitations of the it facilities uh, power i mean all, there's a whole a plethora of things i'm sure that come those, into it all those things are uh yeah and all those concerts are pretty much you know uh, uh what do you call them uh festivals or whatever you want to call it you know the big um group of bands that are playing on, on that mm. on, on those uh shows so yeah, usually this I guess the stage show is usually different for that kind of stuff anyway. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's cool. Uh, I'm just waiting. Then we'll just see how things go until maybe Australia or do they play Australia, right? Or no? no. Why not? I thought they were. Gonna, they but, they uh, they hinted at it. They but hinted no, at it. Nothing has been nothing announced, sure and I, there are gaps in the oh. schedule. But <clears throat> I would maybe doubt they're it. They're trying. You know, you know what I found disturbing about this conversation so far, that somebody actually that somebody actually said, this is a a standard Kiss set. It, it just makes me want to just oh, standard <laughs> Kiss. It's it's gotten Pretty to this is, point yeah. now where it's the same shit all the time. All you know, you know why that you know why that disturbs me, because I because you're a hater. Kiss. No, it's because I gotten into this kick lately of watching the Metallica thing now. They've been showing stuff from their tour that's being started. Okay. And they're for example, their stage set is incredible how it's set up. There's a band that always changes their stuff constantly, doesn't do the same set and stage for the last fifteen years, you know? And also, hey, they change set lists every night but both nights were complete and every single song was different wow what a radical display that was to have different songs every night and not they didn't repeat anything not a single repeated song each night wow you know get me a, get me a violin you know i i mean i just feel sorry for kiss fans at this point when i hear something like that because man i mean you, you, you if you've gone to their first kiss show you've seen them all that's pretty much what it is now, you know. So, but you look, know, I look. I'm still a Kiss fan. I'm still a fan. I'm still probably gonna end up going in November when they come, you know, because I haven't seen them for a while. So, but I mean, come on, Ken. I mean, as as a guy who goes to concerts a lot, Ken, don't you feel slightly gypped when you hear about shit like that? I feel gypped. Uh, that Metallica would give you a concert. If you went back to back at a show to them, you'd have a different concert both nights. Don't you feel that Kiss could at least change up maybe another song besides one? Yeah, I mean, I've always felt that they, you know, could change something, but uh, it's gotten to the point at this point now where it's You're like just satisfied with what it is. It's not. I wouldn't say satisfied. Just used to the the what they're gonna do. I mean. Um, I think it's part of programming uh, things on the KISS side of things. They don't want to change. They just don't want to change. And it's up to Paul. <laughs> so, uh, uh, anything else, I just blame it on Paul. Uh, yeah, Paul's been tweeting. He clear- Paul's been tweeting this week. He clearly doesn't like change. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Oh, he doesn't like. Yeah. But I, I'm just looking at the set yeah. lists, and you know, same as um, May the 27th, same as May the 27th, same as May the 27th, same as May the 27th. Blah 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 blah. Page after page after same as. Um, so you just copy and paste, then. Then it's really easy for you. Well, I don't have to copy and paste, but you know, it <laughs> has become you know the same for many bands. Kiss has always been one of those bands that stays kind of cookie cutter in their sets there were even in the 80s and 90s there'd be changes but they would go whole stretches where there weren't i've just finished doing the tour uh history for the aerosmith book for 1993 and nearly every day is different finding uh, stretches where you know even same as previous night is a a rarity going back to i'm doing pump right now and it's the same it's like what was it uh get a grip i think i was up to 70 different catalog songs on that tour Mm-hmm. Plus the yeah. the three new ones that came in at the end of that, you know, Deuces Are Wild, uh, Walk on Water, and um, Blind Man. You know, so th- there was all sorts of shit like that. And Kiss has never been that band. We just simply have to accept that they never just let's play Acrobat tonight and freak people out. They've never done it. Uh, you know, even Kissing Time became a big promotion in two thousand and six. You know, when they had to pull these things out, uh, all American men the following year, you know, do do the big vote. And for years and years and years until there was the cruise avoided playing the most probably the most demanded kiss song was Mr. Speed, wasn't it? For a a good long while. So why why are they going to finish any different and start, you know, shaking it up every night when the production is clearly so tied to it? Now, that's not to say that a band like Metallica. And I watched the first night in Amsterdam. Um, mm. Was very impressed by it, though I can hear age affecting them now. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, well, compared, you know, the amount of Death Magnetic and Hardwired shows that I've listened to and watched the pro shots with soundboard audio as well and Matrix stuff that's all over YouTube is just absolutely staggering. Uh, You know, the sets that they do, you'll still get Creeping Death, you'll still get Metal Militia, you'll still get all sorts of really good stuff thrown into the mix. But Kiss has never been that band, particularly for the past 20 years. There have been little phases where they have had moments of insanity. But even on the Kiss Cruise, which was supposed to be that moment for diehards to play all that shit, they eventually watered it down into, well, a rehearsal for their tour. Mm. And then the same sets both nights, because it had because the fucking mutiny on the boats from uh, he played something different for them that you were able to sit and watch on the deck or in your cabin uh, but he didn't play it for me well, yeah but you got something else well i want it well fuck you you know kiss fans yeah yeah all right what the fuck were we talking about <laughs> kiss the tour yeah they're, they're... and the end of the south american tour yeah, the end of the South American tour is those audiences were insane. I love the photos that Keith posted on, you know, the socials of them on stage with that sea of people. But there's a pro shot as well. I've seen bits of it uh, from one of those shows, but I don't think it's going to compare to last year. Um, that one from, oh yeah, last that year was one great. last year is just staggering release it's that still, it's still out there yeah 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 it hasn't been gooched yet so talking about really great video that hasn't been gooched yet the midnight special completed uh, the last of its oh, yeah. three um i think one of the channel owners did comment on the missing fourth song um, is that they don't have it, you know, it wasn't aired or so whatever. So who knows what that means as to whether it it's is. in a library, if it's gone. Uh, I mean, it's nearly 50 years on the clarity of those. Obviously we've seen them all for years, for decades, even in black and white kissology, but the sound has just been treated beautifully. And I listen mostly rather than watch, but to go back and just cue those three up, and to watch Kiss. This is pre-alive, a reminder. This is what, April the 1st, 1975, that they filmed this. Mm. And it is just so hungry, so powerful. 
they have only had a taste of the road. They haven't had a taste of success. They can still taste their hand sandwiches. Um, <laughs> it is just really exciting and spectacular. And then you go down the rabbit hole of all the other freaking uh, midnight special videos. I bet oh, yeah. Ken's really enjoying all that. I wouldn't be surprised if Mark's enjoyed some of the other bands as well. But holy shit, to get to relive that. Ken, what's your thoughts on Midnight Special? Has it been a nice moment? Yeah, especially, you know, with Kiss finally popping up. I was wondering if if they'd be able to uh, put it out there or not, uh, the Kiss stuff, because all the other great stuff out there that I enjoy from the 70s. Um, but, yeah, it was cool. I mean, I don't think I ever noticed before the Peter Chris drumstick deal. Yeah, I, I don't think, it, I mean, that's the clearest I've seen it. Um, and uh, that was cool, you know, with the sparks going off on, on those sticks um but yeah it sounds really good and i just kind of still meant you know mesmerized watching it even after all these years and you know i've seen it we've seen it you know not as good you know qu you know clarity but i'm still just watching that those kiss videos and i'll watch it the whole way through and i'm just like mesmerized like you know it's just great <laughs> it's just great stuff it never gets old. So, what's the problem with the same set list every night then? Yeah, it's, it's okay. I mean, they've been doing the same set list since the seventies, <laughs> right? Need to answer that. Since the seventies, they play every. You know, they do go on tour. They set a set list pretty much, and they play the whole thing. You know, the same, except for sometimes when they're trying out one of the new singles that they're releasing, and then sometimes those will drop. But uh, it's always been the same. Yeah, Otherwise. I can't wait. I can't wait to see if Aerosmith fans, uh, you know, they're they're got to have it songs in uh, an Aerosmith farewell set, and what that's going to be like, and how that band straddles um, <laughs> two yeah. different fan groups, and also their own desires. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not gonna. I'm probably not gonna get my my Deuce song in an Aerosmith set, and of course, my Aerosmith song is SOS. Too bad. Um, other than that, mm -hmm. it'll be shame on you. Go figure. Um, ain't going to get either of those, I don't think. But there, there's so many songs there. Mark, what do you think about the Midnight Special now that you've had some time to digest? And thanks for showing it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've always loved this stuff. I mean, as you can see here, they're doing Black Diamond. And there goes the pyro and the drum kits going up. Uh, uh, I, I always thought that this was one of the real big high points on uh, Kissology when it came out. And then when, when I saw this, I was like, wow, like, it, it's just one of their better performances overall, I thought. And uh, it's great to see it. You know, it's, it's great to see that they were able to clean it up. I mean, it, it was pretty decent quality on Kissology, I thought. But this is like even takes it to the next level of the clarity on this. I mean, it's just fantastic how it looks. And, you know, it's worth seeing again. This is this is obviously uh, from an era that I think I can speak for most Kiss fans and saying that this is from an era that we don't get sick of seeing, you know? I mean, this is when yeah. they were very hungry. They were, you know, desperate for success. And uh, it obviously shows in the performance here. I mean, it's just fantastic stuff. I mean, here, here is knocking over the drum kit and he's going to throw it into the audience and all that shit that he did, which is great. I mean, th that... So why did people have a problem when he destroyed his drum kit in October 2000? At the end of well, the last show, it was a they... farewell thing, and you know, yeah. maybe maybe they, maybe they took it the wrong way. But then let's put it this way too: Kiss fa Kiss fans have grown up. Back then, when this was happening, Kiss was what three years old, two years old, a band. You know, Kiss fans hadn't gotten used to bitching about everything at this point. You know, <laughs> you, you have to give yeah. them about twenty, thirty years before they started complaining about every little nook and cranny of something that happened at a concert or whatever. So back then, we were just happy to get a, a good show. And don't forget, KISS was putting on shows that nobody else was really doing back then. Why are we complaining now? Well, because bands are doing it better than KISS, unfortunately. Some bands live, you know, putting on better live shows, giving us different set lists. Every, you know, uh, that's why the complaining is happening. Back then, you know, you wanted to go see a KISS show because, man, nobody was doing a show like KISS. Nobody. So, of course, they, they, nobody gave a shit that they played the same set list because, you know... People got excited when they started playing Firehouse because that means G's going to blow the fire tonight, you know, or, or if they're going to do this song, you know, this is going to happen. You know, like that 
there was anticipation for it then. Now, 50 years on, we're kind of like, oh, here comes Firehouse. Here comes the fire breathing again. You know, we're kind of almost over it, it seems, as a, as KISS fans to some nah. point, I think. No, I think so, one thing that t- to me that ties in is the cost of the concert experience has left such a bad taste in everyone's mouth mm, that they almost show up to a concert pissed off. That ticket bastard <laughs> has charged them four hundred dollars in fees. They're going to be parking. paying fifty bucks for parking. If they're hungry and they want a hot dog, it's going to be you know eight dollars. If they want to have an adult beverage, it's going to be fifteen. Um, you know there are other pissed off people who are you know high, um, not handling their alcohol or lack social mm-hmm. skills to not be doing girlfriend selfie, you know, throughout the whole goddamn show. Um, so antisocial behavior, yeah. especially now post COVID, I, I find a much more fuck you mentality that just permeates the world experience where everyone's just angry about something or someone and mm-hmm. doesn't want to have a good time. <clears throat> So I, I think it's been incremental, and bands have you know brought it on themselves to a certain extent. But I think the whole industry has taken the consumer experience into the gutter. Look at the cost of a ticket throughout the years. Ken, your first Kiss show, what did it cost? What did your last Kiss show cost? Do the math. It, it does yeah. not. Does it compute <laughs> for what well, is essentially say, though, inflation? Inflation, counting inflation. It's going to be the same as if it's what. In, you know, infl- back then, inf- be like a- the numbers don't lie. Your inflation line doesn't go anywhere near the increases. Neither do the yeah. wages being paid to the people um, who work the events, who put on the events, who tour with the okay. events. Those have not yeah. scaled anywhere near inflation any more than anyone's salary has scaled in 30 years what it should have according to inflation. Um, it, that, that's all the lie. It, yeah. So... You know, looking at the experience, it's just everyone's so fucking hacked off. So, Julian, but I am curious, and Ken, I'm curious to ask you this too, but do you think that that, that's also an issue here too? Do you think that back in 75, the KISS show was really different, really fantastic and, you know, something to see, but now, you know, bands have, lots of bands have big budgets now and do all kinds of fantastic shows, and maybe that might have a bit of an issue in it as well, that it's not as spellbounding anymore as it was in 75 spellbounding you know the thing is that there's even though there's you know more technology and all that kind of stuff now it's it's it's, it's all a matter of you know buyer demand really mm-hmm. uh right and you know now i mean if people don't want to pay it they're not going to pay it and they're not going to sell these uh, concerts out. And no one's going to go, and they'll have to lower prices until people do come in and fill the seats. But people are paying. Will they? You know, just with AI music, with a uh, oh, well, with holographic no, technology, no. and people actually consuming that garbage. I mean, you saw those Paul no. McCartney or Beatles songs that surfaced, and some of the yeah. rap stuff that surfing, surfacing from AI. Everything is being devalued. I mean, Mark, all your stuff's up on Bandcamp. All your stuff will have been sampled by AI already. Your whole sound catalog is in the matrix, so to speak. Mm. You know, everything that I've written and put online is part of it as well. Everything that an artist has drawn and put as a portfolio online is online and part of this huge mix that is going to profit a few that the people who actually contributed to building those libraries get nothing out of because there are no rights around it yet to be defined. And you've got bullshit lawsuits like what Ed Sheeran or whatever his name is, uh, little little ginger bastard, um, you know, had to go through with the estate of a songwriter, you know, Mm -hmm. that a chord progression, you know, that that can be copywritten, that no one else can use an A, B, C minor, you know, (laughs) ever again, because it's too similar to the fucking, you know. uh, Yeah, he did win, but Aerosmith lost it. Standing in the Shadows of Love and the Other Side in 1991, they settled, and Holland Dozier Holland got a co-writing credit added on to that song, and 33% of it, of its royalties, moving on. So it, the slope starts back there. Kiss got done for I Was Made for Loving You, and settled. 
So we're at, at the crux. What about Bruce Springsteen then? What? What did Bruce get done for? No, he he had something that was, that was copying "I Was Made for Loving You," one well, of his songs. Well, didn't Shandy copy one of I his songs know. and tomorrow copy the Joe Walsh song? And, you know, the, the, the problem here, people, is that there's only so many chords in the musical so alphabet notes. here. I mean, after a while, there's going to be a song that might have you know the same yeah. chord progression as this song or this song. You know, that the fact is. Is it really the intention of the person to rip it off and make it sound exactly like it? I mean, there are some cases that are obviously clear that they are doing it. But, I mean, just because you're playing the same chords as another song, that doesn't make it, you know, grounds for suing. No, but we're a litigious society, at least in this country, um, mm -hmm. where two of us are located. And it is a disease that has caught on elsewhere because one of the cases, I believe, Ed, uh, his last year's installments of getting sued for his songs was in, I believe, a London court. I'll have to, you know, check that. But, I, I mean, the, the point goes back to AI. Well, maybe uh, AI could have saved Paul's voice. Um, let's move on into, <laughs> into happier areas because there was a really good thread posted this week. And this is going to take us a little bit off of kiss talk but hopefully each one of you of us will have a kiss pick in there and it was i want to see who who originally posted this much too soon posted 10 albums that changed your life and eric singer had recently shared 10 albums that had changed his life and i think tommy had done his Paul has certainly done some of his life-changing albums in the Kiss magazines historically. But I thought it'd be very interesting for our regular listeners, our new listeners, to get an idea about us musically and where we come from to go through our 10 life-changing albums. And then we'll talk about the Kiss ones and maybe a little bit about some of the others that uh, stand out. So, Ken, you want to go first and just list your 10 and then we'll regroup? Yeah, I can list my 10. Um, 10 albums. Here we go. Uh, number one, in no particular order, but it's kind of chronological. Oh, here. come on. You don't have them it's, in order? like It's chronological. You haven't done anyway, math? You people don't much. know how... I have this. Okay, sorry. Before you say, wait a minute. You people, this. what? You, pe uh, you, you, you I, people. You Ooh. people. Okay. You. You. People. You. I, I'm pointing at you right now. Okay. You people, and I and I know this is another person I know. We, Hopefully, we he's are, watching this. We are this, effort okay? phobes. Okay, my one of my other friends who I do a podcast late at night with, he has the same issue where he can't rank anything in numerical order. Oh, I just can't do it. I can't rank my favorite Zeppelin albums in numerical order. I love them all. I go, that's impossible. You can't tell me that every album you like no. equally. That just doesn't make any sense to me at all. So, so when people say that I can't put my songs into like top ten order. Come on, I don't buy that for a minute. But anyways, Ken. I love you. I respect you. Go ahead and say your 10. I'm going to mute Mark now so he can't I, talk for a couple of minutes. Yeah. So, all right. I could rank them, but I'm not going to rank them. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I do rank my Kiss albums, so I can do that. But uh, we're not doing that right now. So, anyway. Uh, all right. Here we go. It, uh, here's the mind-blowing albums here. Uh, the Carpenters. The, the Singles. It's called The Singles. The album's called The Singles. Fantastic. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, Linda Ronstadt, Heart Like a Wheel. Great album. Uh, Neil Sedaka, Sedaka's Back. Other good stuff. Steve Miller Band, Fly Like an Eagle. Nice. Rush, 2112. Nice. I knew you'd like that, Mark. <laughs> uh, Billy Joel, The Stranger. A good pick. Electric Light Orchestra, Out of the Blue. Kiss, alive, alive too. too. Of course, you didn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Alice Cooper from the inside. Fra Whoa. Yeah. Well, there's a reason. I'll explain. I'm that gonna, I, I want to. I'm going to ask you about that one. Yeah. Uh, and Tom Petty, damn the torpedoes. Good album. That's seventy nine. And and there's other honorable mentions, you know, like Aerosmith and so on, Blackfoot and so on. But anyway, those are the ten. Though. Those are your ten. Okay, Mark, you got your ten. I have my 10 in numerical order. Oh, okay. okay, so can you do them numerical. backwards, please? Yes. Number 10, King Crimson, Lark's Tongues and Aspect. Number 9, P 
Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Mm. Number eight, and these are definitely albums that influenced me. Number eight, Van Halen, the debut, Van Halen 1. Yep. Number seven, Genesis, the Genesis album does Shapes 1 with Mama and Ola. Uh, number six, Max Webster, Universal Juveniles. That's a good album. Number five, Yes, 90125. Good album. Number yeah. four, and this one should be a no-brainer, really. Boston, the debut album, Boston. Can't go wrong with that. Nope. Number three, Kiss, Alive One. Okay. Number two, Black Sabbath, the self-titled album, Black Sabbath. And my number one most influential album that it impacted is. me is Rush, Exit Stage Left. Oh, nice. okay. Oh, Live. That, that'll All be right. it. Okay, I've got, I've got one for each of you to ask you about, and then you can uh, also ask each other about picks. All right, my 10. The Beatles, Rubber Soul. Oh, yeah. Quiet yeah. Riot, oh, yeah. Metal Health. Mm -hmm. Def Leppard, Pyromania. Really? Men mm -hmm. at Work, Business as Usual. <laughs> really? <laughs> Kiss. Mark, what am I going to say? Asylum. I yeah. know. Damn yeah. right. Um, Aerosmith. Done with mirrors. Really? Yeah, I mm. say mirrors like the Tarzan movie. Uh, Motley okay. Crue. Theater of Pain. Mm. Rolling mm. Stones. Really? Sticky Fingers. Led Zeppelin IV. Okay. And Black Sabbath. Paranoid. Mm. Now, so. see, the... the, the this is not just sorry. I don't want to cut you off, Julian. But this is interesting because when these are not necessarily our favorite albums. These are the ones that have influenced us. These are think, my top yeah. ten albums that have influenced me, which are yes. also I don't think they would all fit into my top ten. Uh, you know, put me on a desert island, and exactly. I only get ten albums. I, I I don't think too many of these would actually fit there. Mm. Um, for mine. Yeah. I Ken, I want to Slightly ask you changing. about Alice, Alice Cooper from the inside. Really, why? That's what. That's the album that really got me into Alice Cooper, and and down and had me go down that rabbit hole of the history of Alice Cooper. Really, um, that was really the first one. Um, what is that? Uh, the song on that is you know, you're gonna see me now or whatever, right? the mellow kind of ballad song that was on it. And I bought the album and then I thought this is great as a concept album and, and had all kinds of different, you know, interesting <laughs> asylum stuff, you know, about being well, it, it was and, the lunatic. It wasn't it? The lunatic. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. It had serious. Yeah. It's a lunacy. Kind I mean, of stuff. bipolar, stuff. schizophrenic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember had a hard, you know, kind of rock song serious, which is really, really, a deep cut kind of great song but it led me into going back i was like oh yeah i've heard well women bleed and i never cry and then oh yeah i remember no more in mr nice guy when i started going back and looking for these albums like i used to listen hear that on the radio late at night when i was going to sleep when i was young you know um and so i you know so really if i was gonna pick an alice cooper album uh Otherwise, it would probably be Billion Dollar Babies um, for kind of like my probably my favorite one. Um, but this is the album because it's so important that it got me into them and it went down that, like I said, that rabbit hole. Mm. And then I started buying the back cow, kind of like how, you know, Live 2 did for, you know, Kiss. Mark, do you have a favorite Alice Cooper album or, or first Alice Cooper album? Um I, I think my first Alice Cooper album was, if I'm not mistaken, Trash. I mean, the, mm -hmm. I got into oh, really? it really, Literally. really late, right? Like, Literally. I mean, because no, because I mean, really, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't listen to too much. My sister had a few 45s of his stuff before, like 18 and stuff like that. But I was never really into yeah. it. But I think the the first one that I actually bought was like, uh, what's that one that's in that cardboard bustle of love? What's up, that, yeah. That's yeah, a good I album. got that. I really love that album. Uh, yeah. Also, I love, you know, obviously Billion Dollar Babies, and I love uh, what's the one with the, with the finger in the crotch there that got banned, that album cover, uh, the third or fourth album there. Remember, he's on the front cover, and he has his finger in his zipper. Yeah, there. that's the one that has I'm 18. Uh, what's the name of the album? 
Um, love, anyway. it love it to death. Love it to death. Love it to death. That's actually probably one of the ones that I really, you know, really enjoyed. And Killer as well. I got I got an original with the original flyer cal- calendar there. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's probably my Alice Cooper. I'm stuff not quite there. as bad as you with trash because I can't stand Hey Stupid and Trash. Uh, but my first Alice Cooper album was actually Raise Your Fist. And yell, and I oh. still it out. and I still like it. My favorite is it, it, it's tough because you've got classic era Alice Cooper band. Favorite is easily Killer, um, but latter albums I love the the Millennium stuff, uh, Brutal Planet and Dragon Town. Mm-hmm. Just really, really enjoy those. All right, so Mark Rush exit stage. Yeah, that's left. interesting. Why that like Ken was my absolute introduction to Rush. I remember as clear as day, I was very young. I think I was like about eight years old. Okay, we had a turntable. My sister had a turntable in the room and I would go in there and hang out. She had the television in that room as well. We had two TVs in the house. We lived in an apartment actually. So I went there and watched TV and she wouldn't mind because she was cool that way. And I saw on her turntable, she had her headphones plugged into her stereo and she had a record there. And I saw the album cover and it was half open. I saw the pictures of them playing live, and I was like, "Okay, I wanted, I was curious." So I turned on the record player. It was, old, it was one of these really old ones. All you had to do is just turn the volume on, and it turned on, click, and it started spinning. And so I put the needle on, and then right out, right as soon as I heard Getty's voice there, "This is your spirit of the radio," and they started playing, and I was like, "What the hell is this?" And then it, it, it literally, like, for the next you know, 15, 17 minutes that that side A was. I was like transported to a totally different. I never heard anything like that up to that point, and it was on headphones too, which was essential for me, because you really heard the audience, and Neil's drumming is just fantastic on that. And then, of course, once I got to side three, okay, this is a double album, and that trilogy of Brune's Bane into the Trees into Xanadu, it was all over. Mm-hmm. I was like, what is this? I need to sign up, Xanadu. and I was a lifelong Rush fan from then on in. Is that your yeah. favorite Rush album? No, not even by not even close. My favorite That's Rush favorite. album always has been and always will be is Fly By Night. Oh yeah, that's right. You do. How about you, Ken? Yeah. Are you a favorite? Great, <clears throat> you know, it's it's a tough one because um, you had twenty one twelve in your list, didn't you? Yeah, twenty one twelve is it could be a favorite. It's kind of a. either that or or hemispheres. I really like hemispheres a lot. I mean, it's just. <laughs> It's just it's great. Yeah. Just great. I mean, they're all good back in the 70s, though, man. Was that your introduction, though, 2112? 2112 is uh, I was sitting in the back of someone's car, car and these drivers say, hey, you listen to this. And and I hear this screeching voice. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? And it was <laughs> 2112. I found out it was 2112. So I went to the local record store, and I went to get 2112, but... It wasn't my first one I got because they didn't have any. He said, "Oh, it's on order. I gotta get more." So they, do you have, what else do you have? They had Farewell the Kings. I said, mm-hmm. "Oh, so I bought that and I brought that home and I got into that." I mean, you know, that, that's a good, that's a good album. I don't mind that one. It's not Zanad- my favorite, I love but... Xanadu. That's just that's, that's one way, of my favorite Xanadu songs. is way down near the bottom of my least favorite Rush songs in that album. Oh, it's one of my wow. favorite. One of my favorite Rush songs. Yeah, it? my first run-in with Rush as an album, uh, it, rather than just the stuff you'd hear on the radio, was uh, Power Windows. Not a good experience. So I didn't really... Oh, get, really? I, I, I st- stayed away from them um, pretty much <laughs> as a result until Roll the Bones. Oh, and then the I yeah. went back because it caught me. I had that thing. That thing just stayed in my CD deck forever. Um, That's fascinating. I love Roll the Bones. I still do. Is it my favorite album? Yes. No, my favorite album is Grace Under Pressure. Um, wow, there's just there's, something. There's something. Yeah. There's something very haunting about that material. Um, yeah. So it's, no. it's considered so the, their yeah. dark album. Getty Lee said it's one of the hardest albums they've ever recorded. Grace Under Pressure. And you're right, Julian. It is dark because it's very much based around the whole sort of nuclear war and all those things. Mm-hmm. And they also had a good friend die, which is after images written about on there. They're very dark images. And they recorded it all through a Canadian winter in Quebec, which you never want to experience because it's like 70 <laughs> feet of snow. We we'll, we'll never want yeah. to be in Quebec. So there we go. <laughs> So, so what's the deal uh, with uh, the Def Leppard pick? 
I am super, kind of in a way surprised. For, for me, yeah, maybe not. always talks about you know high and dry all the time, right? Yeah, well, oh yeah, high and dry. We're, we're we're not talking about favorite albums here. Yeah. We're talking about influential know, albums. And uh, again, I, I told I did a an episode of um, Mr. K's or Super K Kiss Caram's podcast. I'm sorry, Chris, I'm completely butchering the title. That'll be out in a, I think in a couple of months. And I, I tell the story there that I followed the natural progression of getting into harder edged music, moving from my original kind of rubber soul, um, Sgt. Pepper's Magical Mystery Tour and Shaved Fish were my first four cassettes. Um, and, and that, is, oh, and imagine, how can I forget? You know, so five. Uh, and then obviously Metal Health, Quiet Riot hit. Def Leppard hit, but I didn't know about them. I'm living in America at this time. My friend, who was a Beatles geek, um, we used to go to flea markets. I'd tag along with his family. They'd go flea marketing um, uh, quite often, and he was always looking for Beatles stuff, uh, you know, Apple center rings. I mean, he was really to that level of collector when we were like 9 or 10 or 11, whatever, however old we were. Um, but he got pyromania somehow some why and i heard it and that reinforced the steps that mental health had had on pushing me down a path into i don't think we had mtv on cable at that point that comes later so the twisted sister stuff is 84 85 which leads mm-hmm. us into you know all these influential albums for me mm. whether it's done with mirrors isn't from the same perspective as, say, Theater of Pain and Asylum, which I bought on the same day, on my birthday in 1985, um, because of MTV. Mm. Uh, And that put me down a path, because before that, I was listening to stuff like Men at Work, Duran Duran. um, mm. Who else? Oh, that's... Oh, um... All, all that sort of British stuff. So that's why my influential albums include stuff like Paranoid, which my aunt sent me with a batch of tapes that also included Zeppelin IV, uh, ACDC Powerage, and then there was a, a fourth one mm. that my sister and I would fight over for, uh, who would uh, control these cassettes. But they were our introductions to heavier music. Aerosmith w- was easy because... Um, the band reforming in 84 was, was just really exciting around school and everyone was talking about Aerosmith's back, Aerosmith's back, you know, you know, and I didn't know any of yeah. that stuff. Um, so I got into Aerosmith as a result of the reunion and that was the first new album because of all the hype and excitement of that coming out at the time. So where it all led me is where we are today and books by Def Leppard, books about Aerosmith, you know, books with Kiss and Kiss FAQ. So, you know, again, none of those are, I would put as my favorite. But Ken, you're a live two-pick. What, that is obviously influential because it was your first Kiss album. Mm-hmm. Correct? Yes, it was my first Kiss album. So it was influential as just, just uh, as part of you know, hearing a little bit of rock and roll over and, and then, but then actually buying that, you know, rock and roll over which I didn't have, as we know. And then I bought live two. And then, then I just went down, you know, went crazy after that, similar to, to Alice Cooper. Now I could have easily, uh, on some other picks, I could have said, you know, the Beatles, uh, but you know, I grew up in a household hearing, the Beatles and the Beach Boys for the most part all the time in the 60s when I was growing up. Great music. I loved it, but I already knew it. I was kind of like, it was already already part of whatever. Your DNA. You know, DNA, but melodic stuff. I love the melodic stuff. Therefore, when I went into the, you know, got the Carpenters later on, again, melodies, great melodies, great mm-hmm. written songs. And that's that's kind of a, a lot of my stuff is about that, uh, you know, with Linda Ronstadt and great singing, too. You know, that, that's another part of it. Um, you know, great melodies. Neil Sedaka wrote great melodies, always just great written songs. Well, that's what struck me about your list, that it includes people who would be defined as artists rather than, 
you know, rock musicians who get away, mm. get a lot of. These leeway. are artists, you know. Yeah, yeah. Th- these these but are Russ singers. An artist. Yeah, but she didn't write. You know, she wrote a couple of things. That's it. But she took songs and made them her own. That sort of thing. Yeah. Neil Sedaka comes from the Brill building of writing with Carol King and Neil Diamond and all that from the '60s, and he had big hits and this, you know, sold 40 million records back in the '60s, early '60s. And then became a hit again in the 70s. Um, and that's how I got into him. And then I went into his old stuff, but I liked his 70s stuff. And, and going forward was was, was better um, yeah. for me. But yeah, and, you know, going against Steve Miller Band is kind of a, another one of those things where you just a great band and great, you know, great musicians. music. And and I've said yeah. that Great you music. know about that show I went to see Steve Miller in Binghamton in ninety one or ninety two I, I don't remember I'm not going to dig out the stub I mean it yeah. was just like two hours of great music yeah you'd hear a few of the songs that were big heard hits them a lot on the radio you know you've heard them but then you'd hear over, the stuff that you don't hear good. on the radio yeah. and it was yeah. really good you know just from mm-hmm. start to finish a great you know batch of songs amazing yeah. It's funny because when you guys when you guys are mentioning this, it reminds me my Boston pick, for example. When I was in grade nine guitar in high school, we the guitar teacher who was really good guitar teacher, one of the people that really helped me in guitar early on, uh, and he was a real cool teacher. He's one of those guys who's like, Hey Copernicky, you wanna go get some McDonald's for the class? Take my car. And he would literally let me take his car, go to McDonald's and grab some food for us and come back to get because we were only like Ten of us in this class, right? So he was he was really cool, and he, we were talking about harmony. He was talking about harmony. He goes, mm. and he goes, you know, if you wanted to hear some good shit, you go and listen to Boston. And I was like, who the hell's Boston? And I like I kind of said it quietly like that. And he goes, Copernic, you don't tell me you don't know who the hell Boston is. I go, I've never heard of them. He goes, okay, just a second. We had a he had a stereo in there. And he took out his CD, put it in there, put it on, and I'll never forget listening that we listened to that whole album in that class like loud in that classroom. And I was like, wow, like just hearing stuff like peace of mind and more than a feeling and foreplay long time and all that stuff. I was like, what the hell is this? And he's like, he goes, Mark, I want you to really go home now and listen to this stuff and get, get the second album while you're at it too. It's really good. So, I mean, he was really good with that. And the funny thing is he was a trumpet player really by trade. Like he was not a guitar player, but he was really good at guitar, but he was trumpet was his main thing. That guy could, whoo. You could play like nobody's business. But I mean, the Max Webster thing was also important because mm-hmm. I loved Kim Mitchell and realized that he had a band before that, right? And when I got into that, I was like, wow. And I mean, as soon as I found out that Battle Scar was on that album, like that, that there was a Rush, with Rush influenced yeah. Yeah, yeah. song with them, that was the first album I went and got. And that Max Webster album has always been my cherished possession, my Robert Ludwig mastered first press of. <laughs> You know, right. Universal Juveniles. I love that album. There's not a bad song on that whole album. You know? Yeah, I'm disappointed in you, Mark. Though you didn't list <laughs> Lee Aaron or Triumph. No Triumph. Well, we'll Triumph. Lee Aaron wasn't really a influence on me, although his, his her guitar player lived in the apartment building just down the street from us, which was interesting. And I've also met Lee Aaron a few times at the grocery store. She would shop at midnight. She would never go to the grocery stores during the day. Uh, but, you know, Triumph was something that I got into, again, a little bit later on. I mean, Triumph, you know, they're on the radio all the time. And it was one of those situations where when I bought Rock and Roll Machine the first time, that was the first thing I bought. And I heard that from top to bottom. I was like, wow, OK, I was immediately hooked. I mean, they were one of those bands that as did went later and later, I started going a little less. Like once you got the Sport of Kings, I was kind of like, uh, they're starting to lose me a bit here. And then they totally lost me for surveillance, obviously. That was not that mm. good. But, you know, Allied Forces, Never Surrender, all those albums are just those fantastic. Are you know, you know I, on my honorable mention, I have a Canadian on there. I have Nick Gilder on there, mm. uh, which I really enjoy those those 70s, late 70s, or, you know, early 80s stuff. It's just fantastic, it's, you know, yeah. power yeah. pop songs, you know. So, Mark, yeah, Alive I mean, is your influence. Why? Yes. Alive was my influence because when I was uh, eight years old, around that time, seven, eight is when I started getting heavily into music. Once my sister Jane found out that I had snuck in and listened to her Rush record, she was like, okay, great. He loves music. I'm going to I'm gonna like nurture this. She was really influential in that. Uh, 
she for Christmas under the Christmas tree, I saw you know Mark was wrapped as they clearly look like a record or a calendar. You know what I mean? So yeah. I I grabbed it and I opened it and it was Kiss Alive. That was my first thing I ever got from from my sister as a record. And that was really I was really young then when I got that. And I remember when I opened it and put it on their turntable. She said, "Here." She slapped the headphones on my head to go listen to this. Because all of her friends were huge Kiss fans. I must have told that story a thousand times in that building, that guy that has all this shit on his wall and stuff. And uh, so she let me listen to it. And I pulled out the booklet and I saw those things, you know, with those pictures inside that little booklet there. And I was like, wow, this is, it's like took me to another place. I mean, you got to remember, I was like mm-hmm. seven, eight years old, right? And by the time I was like 11 years old, I had gone to my first concert. Jane convinced my parents to let me go with her to downtown Toronto on the TTC subway all the way down to Maple Leaf Gardens to see Rush on the Grace Under Pressure tour, which is the first concert I ever saw. And I've never missed a Rush concert ever since that period. I've never missed a Rush concert since 84. Wow. Wow. I never got to see Rush. Really? I saw Rush for, I want to say four times. First time was the um, um, Permanent Waves. I uh, went to that one. Oh, I, went to, I went to that one. I went to the Moving Pictures one right after that too. The, um, and then later on, I, I think the song two two more times. Got to remember really that good, I, I'm so. not a big fan of concerts, so because of the people mm-hmm. part, too many people. Yeah. So too gonna, many people going <laughs> people going to parts. concerts could be tough. <laughs> so Paul McCartney. So. Ace is back on the road. Um, mm-hmm. I, I hope everyone doesn't mind that tangent we've just had about some of the other music that's, uh, you know, uh, influenced us because I think it gives you a better idea about some of us. There's no explaining Mark and his hate for Destroyer, but um, go back through his song list and <laughs> maybe maybe you'll under, understand him a little bit better. But he's got some quirky picks, and it's, certainly there's a lot of albums from both of you that I haven't actually heard, so uh, mm. I, I will check some of those out. All right, so back to Ace. Ace has been back on the road, and he started one of his shows by saying that his next album was going to be called, and of course this is Ace. Oh, it yeah. Could, could clearly change, or it could have clearly been a joke, um, though I don't find it very funny. But he said, Walking on the Moon. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, well, Mr. Nice, what do you think of that as a prospective song title sticking with the theme of sp- Base. Um, am I surprised? Putting a quarter in. Am I, am I surprised? No. I mean, you're talking about Ace Freely here. When has he not given us some sort of a title that has to do with outer space or something like that? I mean, I would have been surprised if he gave us a regular song title or a regular album title because, you know, look at he's Space Invader and, you know, it's just he's he's always had this kind of stuff spaceman and he's clearly influenced by outer space and the workings of sci-fi movies and stuff like that so am i surprised no uh the thing i'm going to be very surprised is if this time because he has said also too that this is my best work since 78 Ah. so is it going to be as good as that i mean if it is i will that's what's going to truly surprise me yeah, I think he really needs to call his... He's supposedly working on a second autobiography um, and a new album to go with it. Both should be titled No Apologies. Yeah, no regrets, no apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no apologies. Uh, yep. Ken, yeah. Walking on the Moon. Yeah. I'm, Ace is now a so, moonwalker. So, to me, obvious, I guess. Uh, I... I is it true? I don't know, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me. So, but it made me think of well, walking on the moon. That's a police song, you yeah. Know? And he's and he's gonna do a cover. Would he? Would he? Would he do, do a police cover? a police song and Please. do it in some kind of Ace style? I thought, oh well, God. that could that could be interesting if he Giant tries to do it. So <laughs> Yeah, so that's what I thought. You know, the, oh, is it really a song he wrote, or is it just a t- uh, album title, or is he doing a cover? Because he's he is doing a cover song on on his album, but we don't know what that is yet. So that's what I thought. I thought, well, maybe he's going to do the police song as a cover. Uh, who knows? Ack, indeed. Ack. 
Yeah, when uh, <laughs> when we think about covers for Ace to do, there's only one song he needs to cover. He's gone back and he's done his own kind of versions of the songs that he was responsible for, Cold Gin. Um, he's done Rock and Roll Hell. He needs to cover Out of This World. <laughs> yeah, that would be a song. He <laughs> really needs to cover that song <laughs> because be he needs to show Tommy this is how the spaceman does it because I think it's a good song. Um, but I'd love to yeah, see what Ace yeah. could do with it to aceify it. And if he wants to stick with that cursed space theme, well, Tommy wrote a really good song. So why not take it, Ace, own it, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then you can call him up and say, fuck you, I'm not apologizing, you know, <laughs> for covering, covering your song. But... <laughs> Uh, it, it is interesting, though, that he would go down that path. I mean, that could you imagine? Because like you said, he has done covers before. And, he, and, you know, doing Rock and Roll Hell, I mean, clearly it's a song that he had nothing to do with. And as a Kiss song, you know, that, True. I mean, that, 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 that would be something. I mean, I wonder what Tommy's opinion of that would be. I, I have a feeling that Tommy wouldn't be, feel insulted. I think that he'd be, no. probably feel actually honored about that, to be honest. Yeah, he probably would. Oh, I'm sh I, I, I don't doubt that Tommy would get a kick out of it and would probably, you know, it, it would give him legitimacy, I guess, to a little bit. But you don't equ think, you don't think Ace would want to give Tommy credibility by covering him. That's that's the that's the problem there. He, I don't think he'd ever do that. But it would yeah. be funny if he did. It, yeah. it would it would be fun. Um it'd be and, fun. Yeah. And again, he he really should um you know be calling his album something other than Walking on the Moon, but then maybe there's a great song. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what the album is called what it's packaged as whatever as long as there's some good music on there that that really is what what matters but he's got so many things you know call it taking off the gloves or uh again yeah, yeah. Off the gloves or, you know you hung up on me you know something like that Take, <laughs> taking the high road <laughs> Hey, Julian, I mean you you you've had contact with the freely camp I mean you've done like a little Bit for his CDs before, like a little blurbs, right? No, Stuff like that. I've, so I've, I've should... never had any contact with the the Fraley camp. I've uh, only had contact with Fraley's uh, record label, who oh. Ace probably doesn't know who I am, and he thought the interview mm -hmm. for his liner notes was some fanzine interview, and uh, started off mm -hmm. saying that, that there's a storm here, so the lines are getting bad. <laughs> Ace, this is for oh, yeah. this is for your liner notes. Um, so, so no, I, I have nothing to do with any musicians. Sorry. Because that would be that'd be great if you could have suggest that to him. You know. Well, it, it's all out here, so now someone else can post it on his on his Facebook. You know, Ace, why don't you call your? I don't give a shit. Um, I don't need I don't need a credit for coming up with something stupid. I can do that all day long for free. Get my kicks. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that adds into our topics that I was going to cover today, going into the uh, top 10 influences. But that gives you a little bit more of a peek behind us as people and why some of us hate Destroyer. <laughs> <laughs> and why some of us love um, Asylum, you know? A again, okay. that, it won't be my pick as my favorite Kiss album, but it sure as hell I wouldn't be sitting here without Asylum. So... Um, that's it for this week. Hopefully we get Lonnie back. We will be doing the next round of the death match, which will, on one side, I haven't quite figured it all. On one side, is certainly going to be a live two studio songs going mm. up against Kiss Killers studio songs. And then, of course, there's you can't have songs going up against each other from the same album. So the two from Smashes are going to have to go into separate buckets. And then I guess the, the remainders of the recorded output will all just get thrown in randomly. Um, but, but that's how it's going to match up. And that's so going to be it's going to be eight so, matchups. So the next album or the next, album, the next episode is going to be uh, all done with A.I., right? <laughs> We're, yeah, we're we're gonna use we're, Jasper and Future to come to to uh, kickstart our creative process and do our shows for us because um, clearly 
there'll be enough of well, 468 Kiss FAQ podcasts to sample from, from, to know yeah. what Mark's going to say, to know what I'm going to say, to know what yeah. Ken's going to say, and mm -hmm. we can bring back some of the previous participants' holographs, uh, holograms, whatever. Um, mm. Yeah, the, the, fu the future of podcasting is fake news. So no, it scares, it scares <laughs> the living daylights out of me. What's going to happen with AI and deep uh, fakes? It and scary. it's going to get people killed. It's going to start wars. And I don't see mm. any. I don't see any more benefits coming out of AI than came out with the computer. They said the computer is going to make our lives easier. We're going to have more leisure time. We're going to have paperless offices. All of it was bullshit. <laughs> And I'm I not projected being, in five I work. Years. I work in IT. You know, <laughs> computers have made you know some parts of things better in terms of the number of calculations that can be run sure. in a second. So from that perspective, but it hasn't made your healthcare cheaper. Hasn't made your mm -hmm. lives longer and better. Um, it hasn't made people smarter. It hasn't given you more free time, yeah. and it sure as fuck isn't paying you more per hour. You know, whenever you hear somebody talking about the computer thing, it reminds me of that Simpsons episode where that scientist guy goes, I project in the next five years, a computer will be 10 times this size and only the top five richest people in the world could ever afford one. Remember that? Do you ever see that episode when they're showing the old computers with the real to real machines? The big world, yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, they got that wrong. Yeah. The Simpsons got far too much right. God damn them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> The Simpsons will be celebrated as the 21st century Nostradamus. So, all right. There we go. That's it for this week. Uh, so for now, from Mark, from Ken, and myself, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.